I am Sponi Sozondi. We are doing English first additional language today. So I'll be doing paper one quickly and then Mrs. Mbanjo will do paper three and then Ms. Tengabini will do paper two. Please do not leave um, when I actually sit down because another person will come in and do the presentation and after the next person the third person will do the presentation. We won't keep you long, we know it's, it's Friday, so but please be seated until all the three floats are done. So we'll try and make sure that at least before uh, the set time will be out of here, we do understand that it's Friday. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, enjoy. All right, for today, my dear colleagues, we are looking at visual literacy. It's a very important aspect of our paper one in first additional language English. Why am I saying this is a very important aspect? It's because it covers about 40% of our paper. So if our learners can master visual literacy, we'll be able to um, analyze graphs and answer questions based on them, analyze cartoons, advertisements, and so on, and be able to respond to the questions that require the understanding based on the visual text. They'll be able to get 40% already from their paper one. Then they'll get more marks from um, comprehension passage, uh, question five, as well as question two. So if our learners can master this aspect, they've got um, level three already, which is 40%. So that's why this is so important. And why are we doing this today again? It's because we do know that our learners are still struggling in this aspect. So we are going to look at it in detail, but it's important to know that visual literacy is not only found in question three, which is advertisements out of 10 marks, and question four, which is cartoons out of 10 marks. Even from your section A, your comprehension text is uh, text A out of 24 marks, and then your text B there out of six marks, it's a visual text. So just from the beginning, there is a visual text, and our learners will have to get marks from the very first question. Question two, there is no visual text. From question three, there is a visual text. A uh, Question four and question five as well, towards the end, there is a text again out of six marks. So from question one, We've got about six marks. From question three, advertisements, 10 marks. Question four, 10 marks, your cartoon. And then from our question five, we've got about six marks. In total, this is 2026. 20, this is about 32 marks out of 80. So this is 32 of 80, which gives us this 40% I spoke about earlier on. That is why this is so important. And when we teach our learners, let us make sure that they understand the importance of visual literacy. It's not just an art, right? it's not just a cartoon, it's not just a graph or whatever, or a flowchart or whatever. It's a very important aspect of their lives. All right. Let us start with this. Okay, let us start with this. What is visual literacy? Visual literacy is the person's ability to interpret. So if you are visual literate, you're able to interpret a graph, you're able to interpret a cartoon, you're able, you're able to interpret a flowchart and a mind map and so on. And you're able to even create visual information. You're able, you're able to navigate through an advert and say, okay, this is what the advertiser is trying to say here. You're able to understand images, you're able to understand cartoons and be able to make sure that this makes sense to you. You can't tell someone what this advert is about. You can't tell someone what this cartoon is about. You can't tell someone what this mind map will actually um, be about in the end. So it's very important that our learners do understand. Because sometimes 
Learners do not pay attention because they don't know the importance of this. They don't know why this uh, is important. Why am I doing this? Every day in our lives, we've got adverts, we've got cartoons on TV, on newspapers, on magazines, and so on. And we should be able to read that information, understand it, and be able to communicate that information. It's very important. Um, and then, it's also important to understand the features that we have to master if we are going through any visual um, text or any visual piece. Every time there will be facial expressions, especially when it comes to, especially when it, it, it comes to cartoons, advertisements as well, F facial expression. And the learners should know, should be able to tell what is it that they see. Is the person heavy? Why are they saying the person is heavy? Is the person sad? Why is the person... What do you see there? Is, if the person is frowning, if the eyebrows are up there, what does it mean? Body language, and so on, and so on. So let me just go straight to advertisements then, and just look at important aspects of our curriculum. Okay, what are advertisements? Advertisements often try to convince the readers because we are focusing on print advertisements here because our learners won't be exposed to um, listening to a, a, a radio, uh, whatever, and then respond to it. It's, it's not oral this time, but it's written, it's our paper one, it's not our paper for which is listening uh, comprehension or whatsoever. So in this case, the advertiser will try by all means to convince the reader that, you know what, you can't live without this product, you can't live without this service, we have to go to this event, you can't miss it. So it's no longer a want, but you need this. So that is what the advertiser is trying to actually make sure that, you, you know what, say this and say, you know what, I can't miss it. I'm going to the shop to buy it. I'm going to um, a particular event. I'm going to watch this and so on and so on. So it's very important that before the learners even go through the questions, they should be able to pick these things. What is it that the advertiser is trying to tell me? Why is the advertiser trying to say this to me? Am I the target market? Am I the target audience or not? Features of advertisements. Important elements of advertisement. This is very important. We know of our Ada principle, and I'm sure from grade 10 we've been drilling our learners um, with this principle, what it means and how is it depicted in each and every advertisement. Let us go back again and make sure that that is instilled as we revise for the trial examinations as well as final examinations in October. Very important every time. The advert will make sure that there is a target market that is aiming for them to respond to the advertisement. The target market then is a specific group or population that the advertiser is aiming for them to respond and buy the product, use the service, or even go to that particular event. The problem with our learners, whenever they're asked, about the target market, they say everybody. Who is this advert aimed at everybody? That is, it, it can't be. There is not even a single advertisement that is for everyone, no. It's either an advertisement, it's for uh, black females for a particular reason, or it's for people with skin problems, it's for those who are um, extra size or uh, a bit fat and so on and so on. They have to see that, okay, the target market here, this is for parents, you see? And then the layout, the layout, whether um, it, this has to do with a colorful advertisement, the way it's written, body copy, and all of those things, and the font size, which words are written in bold, in italics, in capital letters, and why would be a reason for that. And then there'll be a logo, they have to know that there is a logo and this is a logo, whether it's in words or it's an actual symbol or a sign. And they have to know that this is a slogan, this is the catchy phrase 
that is related to the product, that is related to this service, that the advertiser is aiming for me to actually remember this because the slogan would be a memorable and a catchy phrase that whenever you think about a particular product, you say, oh, okay, this is the slogan. I'm loving it, then you know, oh, it's McDonald. Good for you, oh, it's spa. So it's, it's there, that's why I can remember these things because that's how the advertiser has done it in the past and it's for ages we can remember these things because it's memorable it's catchy the very important phrases and then at times you may find that there is a very thin line between a fact and an opinion and every time the advertisers will make sure that they give a lot of opinions than facts who is supposed to Go through the advertisement and find this out. It's the reader. It's the target audience. And then the effectiveness of color or the lack of color thereof. Sometimes you may find that the advertisement has like various colors for a particular reason. And sometimes you may find that the advertisement has that black color background. And that may mean something. The language used. Every time the advertisers may use cliches, because we are familiar with them, may repeat particular phrases or words so that they emphasize. They may use figurative language, especially the pun, especially the sound devices, whether it's onomatopoeia, um, assonance, alliteration, and rhyme sometimes. And rhetorical questions may also be used by the advertiser to make sure that you actually reflect and think about this and say, you know what, I do not just want this, but I need it. Let me go and use this particular product. Okay, advertisements may have many different language feature, features depending on the target audience. If the advertisement is for the youth, teenagers, then they use informal language have words like cool, what's up, all of those things. And then if the advertisement is for business people, the language that would be used there will be formal. Then use formal jargon that is related to that um, group of people. And then it's also, the language will also be related to the purpose of the advert. Is the advertiser aiming to sell a product? or this advertisement is just to inform the public about a particular service or it's to invite people to go to a particular event and so on so the language will differ according to the context that the advertiser is aiming to achieve all right advertisers use use carefully chosen language again as i stated earlier on these are just some examples for example, special offer. The moment you see that, you want to know what is it that is special about this. What is it? Uh, how much was it? And how much is it now? Words cool, especially for the teenagers. Then you know, oh, this is the best product for me. It's, 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 it's for me because I'm, I'm, I'm young and it's cool. It's going to make me um, cool with other peers as well. Exclusive, very different. Cheaper, free, buy one and get one free. We like that bargains, we always uh, go for them. That's why advertisers will always use this. Later special, if you are trendy, you'd like to try everything that is new, then you'll go for such advertisements. Gem in the best, guaranteed results, especially with facial products, and slimming tablets and all of those things. Look no further, so your problems will be solved by this product, by this service, and so on. And then, advertisers will always try to make sure that you feel like, you know what, I've tried one, two, and three. This is the best product because it's going to solve all my problems. It's going to cure all my diseases. It's going to solve problems. And it's going to change my life for the better. My life is going to be different. I'll never be the same just because of this product. So these are the promises that 
will come up with advertisers. And our learners should be able to find this by themselves before they even go through the questions. And then our aid of principle. How do they attract the attention of the readers? They use humor, both for advertisements and, and cartoons. Again, rhetorical questions as I did allude to this earlier on. And then, most importantly, they appeal to your senses by using those words I was speaking about. So there will be a lot of persuasive language and emotional, uh, emotional language, emotive language rather, so that you feel as if you can't be left out. You have to be part of this. And most importantly, even when they design their slogans, they want you to be part of it. Let's do it, for example, Nike. Let's do it. It's like, like, let them do it. Let's do it. You are part of this. You are important. So that's why you should buy this product. You know, spa, good for you. So without spa, then uh, they, they, there's something that's missing. So you'll always be involved in their slogan so that you see the importance of using their products or their services for that matter. Uh, I spoke about uh, sound devices, your alteration, rhyme, and so on. And then play on words which is your pun. We normally say this again when we look at cartoons, but we find it here. Especially when, when we look at slogans. Excuse me. And then, the advertiser will aim that the reader actually imagines himself or herself using this product. That's why you have a person there, probably a before and after, and we have a person there opening that particular product or uh, smearing it over and whatsoever, so that you, as a reader, you actually imagine yourself using this product. Thereafter, they'll make you feel special. That's why in their slogan, uh, I said, as I said earlier on, they'll, they'll make sure that the slogans involve you. You feel like I'm part of this. I'm important here. Okay. When it comes to persuasive language, then the advertisers usually choose positive language. So every phrase, every word that they may use would have some positive connotations. If they do use words with negative connotations, the other words will be written in bold, which would actually emphasize and bring about the positiveness. So this is a bad product, but we are the best. And then they make sure that there is this positive and emotive language that says, you know what, get rid of the product that you've been using all along. This is a new product that you can use now. Or don't worry about the new products that you've seen uh, recently. Focus on us. We've been here for quite some time. So use us. They appeal to the reader's personality. So they know that the young people would like to wear this kind of clothing and then they make sure that they focus on them. Association. That's why the advertisers will use famous people, whether it's musicians, soccer players, and so on. Why? So that you associate it. If Lucas Hardebe is using this product, why, why not me? Who am I not to use it? You see? And then there will be testimonials as well that uh, so and so has used this product, and this is how it has helped me, and so on. And to just make sure that the product looks credible, and it looks reliable, that if, if, if you actually use it, you can see the results, then make sure that they'll speak about the year of establishment, that this, this has been here since 1902. And then they say, okay, this is a good company then. If they've been here from 1902 up to now, then I can trust this company. I can trust this product. It's credible, it's reliable. And they can even use statistics that it gets rid of 99.9% .9 gems. Then you know, okay, this is the best 
products only. Okay, let's look at some examples of persuasive devices. I know that in our classrooms you may not um, do it in such a fashion, but it's important for us as teachers to be aware of this so that um, whenever we find time, we go to our classes and revise these important aspects. Persuasive devices. At times, the advertiser would make sure that the promise or the product or the language used appeals to patriotism, which is the love for your country. For example, if the product has that stamp, proudly South African, and then why buy an American product? Why buy an Australian product if this is a proudly South African product? Then this is a persuasive device or language relating or appealing to patriotism. So if you are someone who loves South Africa, you say, you know what, I'm buying this just because it is made here in South Africa. It's important for me to support South African products. Flattery, appealing to readers' pride or vanity. So for someone who likes to be different, then the advertiser will use some persuasive language just to make sure that, you know what, okay, if I buy this product, I'll be the best in the area. I'll, I'll be the only one who would look different and so on. Appealing to nostalgia, for example, you might find that uh, there is a phrase from the best days of school, for example, and then you, you, you try to reflect, oh, I had the best days in high school, and then, oh, this product was already there at that time, let me then uh, use it. Appealing to fear, especially uh, in South Africa, we know that burglary is a norm, and then they may say, Every day, burglary is reported. Install our alarm system and be safe. So because you are scared, you know that mm -mm, it's not safe yet. Probably your neighbor um, did experience that in the past or yourself. And then you say, well, let me then install their alarm system because I am fearful, I'm scared. Let me then make sure that I'm safe. So appealing to desire for conformity. Uh, that may be a phrase that, that may use. Appealing to the fear of rejection. What if you lose your job? Who will fight for you? Join legal. Mm -mm -mm. You see? So because you are afraid of uh, rejection that your boss might say, you know what, I've had enough of you. Bye-bye. Uh, then you say, you know what, I think I need to join them. So that's why they will use such phrases because they know that some, some of the people are really experiencing these thoughts. Appealing to conscience or sense of morality or shame, don't be a rebel, and so on. Appealing to love and concern for family, finding it hard to get family together these days, try our brilliant lamb dinners. So these are all the devices that advertisers may actually use to make sure that they lure you to come and use their product or buy their product. All right, let's look at this as well. They normally start sentences with an imperative that you should do this, never, and so on, so that you feel a need or a sense of agency that you know what, I have to do this quickly. I have to do this in a very important uh, way, otherwise I lose a lot. And then they use memorable images. I spoke of association earlier on. If they use just my face, no, nobody knows me that much. So if they just use my face, who would buy their product? But if they use someone who is famous, someone who is well known, then there'll be a memorable image there and so on. All right. Remember that the aim here or their objective is to, is to convince you as the target audience to buy the product. All right. And then there is also the issue of bias, stereotypes, and all of those things. They may use those to get to you quickly. They also use codes, whether it's a code from uh, Nelson Mandela, it's a code from whoever who is a famous person. 
so that you find this very important and say, you know what, I have to use this product. Then let's say you are in the classroom and then you just provided an advertisement to your learners. And then you do not give them questions to answer and write down, but you want them to identify all of these features that we've spoken about, all of these devices. These are the questions that you can actually use to make sure that your learners understand the advert, that your learners understand your, the, the advert before even attempting to answer questions, like written questions. For example, what makes an advertisement, this particular advertisement, effective? What do you see there? They may speak about the font size, a lot of those things, color, and so on. Have you ever bought a pro this product or any other product just because you saw it on TV or just because you saw it on a newspaper, magazine, newspaper or article or magazine or whatsoever? What do you think of advertisements that are aimed at children? Can famous celebrities in advertisements make people want to buy a product? Do you think beer and secret companies should be allowed to advertise? Why and why not? Why do some companies use celebrities in their ads? Let's look at this example. SAA invites you to go see Southern Africa. Great experiences, great value. Hashtag go see South Africa. And if you look at this one, before you even understand, even if you're not very familiar with SAA or what this stands for, but if you look at this logo there, this has to do with South Africa. Although the advert is about Southern Africa, not just South Africa, but you can see, okay, this is probably a South African company that is advertising here. So South African Airways, SAA, so it's inviting people from abroad to visit South Africa. If you are a South African, then visit other um, African countries in the Southern Hemisphere. The moment you see the animals there, then you know, okay, you can go to um, zoo, to the zoo, whatever. And then you can speak about everything, font size, uh, the images, and all of those things. This is another one, which looks like a poster, because posters are also forms of advertisements. Classrooms available, and so on and so on. So the moment you see this, different colors, different font sizes, all of these things, why catch the attention of the, the reader and there is information that if you need these coaching classes and so on, you can go there. So you are given the details. There is the number if you want to phone and all of those things. So it's important for our learners to understand that advertisements are different. And in each and every advert, they should be able to pick that difference and say why is this different from the other. Lace, belt on, and then the African flag is there, which is a symbol of South Africa. This says then, this is a South African product. It, it, it particularly uh, captures someone who loves South Africa or someone who is from South Africa. And then there is, okay, let me skip this one. There is this advert. Fortunately, it's, it's quite big. So this is it. I hope you can see it. And then there are some questions. What product is being advertised? So you level one, two questions. To whom would this adver advertisement appeal? And again, they, they, they cannot say black people just because that there is a black face there. So they have to read, understand, and say, okay, it's for people who love their skin, for people with skin problems, for people who need uh, some skin treatment, and so on. Identify the slogan used. 
What technique does the advertiser use to draw the reader's attention? What does the advertiser include? Why, sorry, does the advertiser include the banana image? So obviously the product uh, used, uh, uh, manufactured in in banana or any other hair. These are herbal products. Why is the word approved part of the advert advertisement? So it speaks of credibility and reliability. How can the reader obtain more information about the advertisement? So the information is there. So there is a website and other things. Discuss whether the advertisement would convince you to buy this product. So if you look at these questions out of 10, they are different levels. So it's 40, 40, 20. If you look at them slightly so. So you can just take any of these advertisements or any advert from the newspaper, from the magazine, from Google, and then you create your own questions. You can even give them adverts, just adverts on their own and say, you know what, create your own questions and do your memorandum. All right, so I hope that was clear. May I please rush to cartoons? Are we still together? Yes. Okay, everything is still okay? No questions or any comments? Continue. Okay, thank you very much. Continue. All right, let's then go to cartoons quickly. Okay. Some of the learners do well or do better. Let me stick with better. Do better in advertisements and they struggle to do well in cartoons. I'm not sure whether they just get confused by the frames and the characters there, or it's the language, it's a bit difficult and so on. But it's important for our learners to look at a cartoon as a story. So if you look at it as a story, then okay, the story begins, so if, if uh, the story is a story, then there will be the introduction, there will be um, the body, there will be your climax and so on, the ending, there will be a setting, there will be characters, and so on. So if our learners can look at a cartoon just like that, then it might be better, they, they, they might understand it better than before. So a cartoon is a special kind of a visual text because it usually combines a drawing, like the characters uh, are there, and the, 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 the bubbles as well are in the form of a drawing, whether it's a speech bubble or a thought bubble. Cartoons often pick on one current news or event and they criticize people whether it's the president of the country whether it's the public protector and so on or um, anything in the society but they, they always speak on controversial issues then the following devices are often used to achieve this aim whether it's, it's, it's actually to create humor, to be sat satirical and so on. There will always be exaggeration in the form of caricature. And then, in most cases, there will be irony because that is where we find our humor. The learner should know that if I can't find humor here or any irony, then I have to read again until I find it. Okay, every time there will be a contrast between the picture and the text, which is irony, and then that's where you actually find your humor. And then there will be symbols every time, whether it's, um, it, it, it's a soccer pole or whatever, or it's a bus, whatever. But there will be symbols every time on your cartoons. These are important features. There will be thought bubbles, there will be speech bubbles, and now that I should know how to differentiate a thought bubble and a speech bubble. How do I know that this person is angry if I go through this cartoon? And then there'll be frames. So um, a cartoon strip would have frames and then just the cartoon there'll be one. Nobody we look at cartoon strips because there'll be frames there, frame one, frame two, frame three, and let us thrill them to understand if the question says refer to frame one, let them focus on frame one. If they have to compare frame one and frame four, then they should be able to do so. Caricature, which is the exaggerated nose or head or whatever, exaggerated figures. 
or features, colors as well, stereotypes, whether it's a gender stereotype and so on. And then, this is very important. Our learners still struggle to understand body language. If someone's hands are lifted up or stretched out, what does it mean? If um, the eyebrows are up, if the mouth is wide open, what does it mean? They should be able to understand this. So let us go back again and focus on such important features. Issue of the font. Why would the cartoonist write this in capital letters? Why would the cartoonist write this uh, with small letters and so on? Punctuation marks, especially the exclamation marks and the question marks are normally used here to, for the, to emphasize some aspects in the cartoon. Then when analyzing a cartoon, as I said earlier on, that you should look at it as a story. Because the story will have these elements. If our learners can understand this, then they'll be able to understand cartoon, they'll be able to find humor and be able to explain the irony or the satire in that cartoon. Sometimes you find that there is a couch there, then a table or whatever, then the learner will know, okay, this is in the dining room table. If there is a bed and the lamps and all of that, then the learner will know, oh, okay, this is happening in the bedroom. Is it during the day or is it night? If the lamp is lit, then okay, it's at night. That is the setting. It's, it's important. The cartoonists put those important details there because they are important. Then the characters. So sometimes they'll be told, note, the lady is uh, Julia and uh, the boy is Julia's son, uh, Conrad, whatever. What actions and emotions are communicated through the body language of the characters? So what is the character doing? The mouth probably is uh, wide open. You can say, okay, I think uh, this person is yawning. He is in the bed or whatsoever. So we have to be able to associate emotions and actions. You have to associate emotions and actions with the character. So that's important. An English pal educator. Currently a chief marker for English paper three. Today, I want us to look at paper three and I will commence with section C. I understand, colleagues, that we have taught from the beginning of the year up to now and now we are just sharpening the source for our learners so that they will get 100%. And I can assure you, colleagues, that if learners are taught in the right way, they will get 100%. Last year, we had a lot of candidates getting 100 out of 100. And we want that 100 out of 100 so that our learners will get good levels. Now, I want us to start with section C. With section C, colleagues, you know that we deal with the shorter transactional writing. Shorter transactional writing, which is out of 20. Out of 20 marks, and the content is 12 marks, you know that. The language is 8 marks, and that is 40%. And for us is to make sure that our candidates, they get 20 out of 20. It is described as a short written exchange of information or a written record of communication. We know that. And our candidates are expected to write 80 to 100 words. Please emphasize that. They mustn't exceed 100 words because they'll be penalized. Even if their work is perfect, they won't get 100 because they've exceeded, we will have to subtract. And what is important here is to know the features of each text. And I have created this uh, acronym 
which sounds like a sentence and someone will say no trails spells there's a problem with concord no just regard trails as the name trails spells peer what does that mean these are the things that they should know when they go to write their section c it's easy their checklist they will use it as their checklist and trains t is for the toll r is for register we know those two are always together the tone the register a is for audience whom are you writing to i is for the intention the intention the purpose of writing what you are writing obviously the language is there and the style coming to the spells spells the s is for spelling p is for punctuation e is for examples l is for the language another l is for the linking words and the last s it is for the structure the structure is very very important because it is also what we normally call it the format of the piece of writing we are writing you yeah, are you have written and the very last one is peer PA has to do with planning. P is for planning. E is for examples you are giving. E is for elaboration or expatiating on what you are writing about. And R is for reviewing. It is very, very important that you review what you have written. Colleagues, in this section, there are three categories. And in these categories, now as they be writing their trial exams, it is very, very important that as they go to the exam room, they know what they are going to write in section C. The first category consists of four pieces. Invitation card, advertisement, flyer, and the poster. Category B is that of a diary entry and postcard. Category C, instructions and directions. By now, as they'll be writing their trial exams, they must know, am I going to write an instruction? If the candidate is good in instructions, let him or her also be good in directions because one of the two will be there. With me, I have brought the two, I can refer you to the June paper that they have written this year and the November paper in 2018. You will see what I'm talking about. For category B, it's a diary entry. I know our candidates, they love diary entry, but you need to really train them what is important, what are the features that should be in the diary entry the diary entry goes with a postcard unfortunately as we did with candidates from townships from rural areas mostly as we are not that much exposed to traveling going abroad this need to be drawn and give the candidates the picture of what a postcard is. Remember, a postcard, wait, I just want to write it somewhere. Thank you. This is the, the format of a postcard. There is the stem and, and the candidates need to see this. This is how it looks like. If you have gone abroad, obviously in the country where you are, you will buy a postcard. And then you will write a little message to your friend or your relative or whoever back at home. Remember, postcards are meant for if one is in another province, or if one has gone to another country. Why am I saying so? Right now we are in KZN. 
and it happens that I am in Cape Town. I am sending a postcard now. As I am sending it, I will send something like this. This will be the stamp, okay, address uh, as Zondi, and I will write Zondi's address. But what is important about Zondi's address? After writing it, Deben, whatever, I must write KZN. If KZN is not there, your postcard is incomplete. If I am in another country, it is important that I write RSA because I am in another country. And if RSA is not there, KZN is not there, your postcard is incomplete. Remember, uh, with the postcard, let's go. Okay. With the postcard, no, this is category B. Yes, thank you. With the postcard, it goes with a diary entry. A diary entry, please, 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 colleagues, emphasize that a diary entry, if it is one diary entry, there will be one, a day, and a date, D, A, diary, and the candidate will write. And remember, this is very personal. It's about I, me, myself. It's not about he, she, they, they are. No, no, no. It's very personal because the candidate will have to express his or her emotions about an experience that is there. Remember, in paper three, it's better to link the three. A reflective essay, a letter of gratitude, and a diary entry to train this issue of being personal. It's about myself, I, me. Those that are old, they know. When I'm a trade, when he sings, when she sings, I, myself, I, me, myself, I. So that is a diary entry. And category A, if you go and review the previous exam papers, you will see that if there is a poster, there is no flyer, there is no advertisement, there is no invitation. They ask only one from this. Invitation card, it is important to include the basic information, which are who is invited, what is the information, the venue, the date, and the time, as well as the RSVP and the contact details. Others are very optional to say the guest speaker will be so and so, the dress code, yes, you will not be penalized, but these are the basic information that should be in an invitation. You will remember that they always say illustrations and, and drawings are not needed. Yes, don't let our candidate waste time by illustrating. What is important is the language. This is the language paper. Uh, when teaching advertisement, flyer and the poster, my dear colleagues, please teach them once at a go so that the candidate will see the differences. What is the difference between an advert and a flyer, a flyer and a poster? And give examples. For example, on the 8th of May, we all voted, aren't we? What did we see on the board? Were those the flyers or posters? No, 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 no. They were posters. You ask them to go and see the posters. What information is there? It's about the event. Where will it be held? And it even has a slogan. Mr. Zoli had said much about the slogan. Yes, that is what a poster is meant to. KZN will have to go to Mabida Stadium to meet for the rally. These are things that will be there. That is a poster. And what about a flyer? When we go to town, we always get people at the corner of the street giving us the pamphlet. 
giving us those papers saying, do you want a loan? They know teachers love loans. <laughs> do you want a loan? You can get a loan easily from here. Others, they say, are you computer literate? Do you want to do computer? Those are the flyers. Do you see the difference now between a flyer and a poster? Advertisement, Mr. Zoni had well much. Advertisement, it is in line with the IDA principle. Those who know uh, business studies and economics. IDA, A-I-D-A. One has to be attracted and develops that interest and have a desire to add. And in acting is to buy. Just think of a, 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 a KFC. Yeah, I'm old. A KFC advert. When you look at it, obviously it will say come and buy, come and buy, come and buy. Streetwise too. And you start salivating and you will look at your pocket how much do you have and then you buy. So we want our learners to create what product is being advertised. Who is the target group? Those are the important things for an advert. And please make sure that they understand as they are going to, to write. Those who are very, very good, they can go for category A. Those that are struggling, diary entry and postcard is the easiest. Because if a diary entry is not there, definitely a postcard will be there. And these are the questions. Normally, for category A is 3.1, category B, 3.2, category C, 3.3, one of the two. So you can train them and train them. With the instructions and directions, it starts with a verb. And for the directions, there must be uh, 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 the point of departure and the destination. And for the instructions, we must know what is needed, what needs to be done. Just as we did when we were in primary school, taught how to make tea. You never say drink tea. No, you start by saying you boil water, you prepare the tables. You see that I am beginning with a verb, a verb, a verb. So, for section C, it is important, my colleagues, to teach the rubric. The rubric will enable our learners to get the total. A rubric consists of five levels, inadequate, elementary, moderate, skillful, and exceptional. And the content for this one is 60%, that is 12 out of 20, and 40% is for the, the language. Content, planning and form, it's a CPF, that's 12 marks. Language, style, tone, register, audience and all those things in 8 marks. And if you give the candidate 5 out of 20, it means the candidate you have given him or her 25%. 7 to 8, 40. 9 to 11, 55. 12 to 15, 75. But we are all aiming at getting 100%. Let the candidate get 16 out of 20. Before I move to section B, colleagues, are there any questions? Any questions? Any questions for section C, colleagues? Hello? Hey. No questions. No questions. Can I okay. move? Can I move okay. to section B? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, section B. Section B is worth 30 marks. And again, if they get 20 marks for section C, we want them to get 30 marks and then they will have level 4. Section B, it's a longer, the other one was a shorter. 
I'm not going for decrease of comparison. Mm -hmm. In this section, there are four categories. And remember, it's still the same. Trails, spurs, peer. It's the same. Section B and section C. But here, it consists of four categories, not three categories. That is why when you look at the previous papers, you will see that there is 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and 2.4. 2.1 is all about letters, except the covering letter. Formal and informal letters. And the candidate must know how to write a letter. How does a formal letter differ from an informal letter? The obvious difference is that a formal letter has two addresses. And in the second address, there must be an addressee to whom is it written. And with the friendly letter, you just write dear Tuli or dear small or whoever. You are allowed to say dear or not to say dear. Anyway, if he is not dear, he is not dear. <laughs> the format must be there. And what differs? Addresses, the salutation, and the conclusion. For the formal letters, the conclusion should be yours faithfully and you must write your saying, your initials, and you must sign it. Although, in our new kept document, they say candidates can also say yours sincerely. The candidates cannot be penalized for that. But now, I want us to train our candidates of the content of the letter. Remember, 120 words, 250 words, it's about the content. There are three standardized paragraphs for a letter. The first paragraph answers the question, why do I write this letter? Maybe it's a formal letter, you went to shop right, you bought something, and when you arrived home, that was, uh, uh, that had expired already. So you write a, a complaint letter. How are you going to write it? It's a formal letter. There will be your address, your date, addressee, it's the manager of the shop, spa or pick and pay or shop right, wherever you have bought it, and then there will be a salutation, dear sir or madam, and there must be a topic sentence. What is it? Complaint about bull brand team, if it is so. First paragraph. It consists of two to three lines. Two to three lines for that. Why? If we are just stating, why do you write this letter? You are writing, on this day, I bought a bull brand tin, and when I arrived home, the bull brand of mine had expired six months ago. Full stop. And then below, now, you expatiate on the reason that you have stated above, whereby you say, unfortunately, you didn't check it before cooking, and you cooked it, etc., and then the whole family got sick, and uh, everything happened. And the, the second paragraph has more marks, because that's where you expatiate. Remember, peer. Peer says, you plan, you elaborate, you give examples, you review. And the last paragraph will be for you to recommend. What do you want? Yes, you narrate, you describe, and it's easy. In, it's about you. I remember Auntie so and so when he came, when she came with her big head. Uh, ululating from the gate. <laughs> is, is it in the picture? No, but all those memories they come to the fore because this is a reflective essay. You reflect on something that had already happened. And the tense, the tense is in the past tense. Remember, we have 12 tenses in English. So in this case, we deal with the past tense, four past tense. Simple past, 
past continuous, past perfect, and past perfect continuous tense to make you easy. But still on that, facts had to be written in the simple present tense. If it is a fact, it is a fact, it will always be in the present tense. So we have covered three essays. And now, coming to the two twins, so the twins again, the two essays. That is an argumentative and a discussive. If you decide to write an argumentative, make sure that you have four points to support or to be against the topic. I always love to make this example that women are the best drivers. <coughs> Argumentative is You must have four points. Women are the best drivers. True or false? If you say true, you are okay. If you say false, you are okay. Then, what, do, what is needed? Only four points. Your first paragraph will convince me that you agree with the topic or you disagree with the topic on these points we just mentioned them. And then the first paragraph, you will say, women are the mothers of the nation. They are very cautious when driving. You will write about them being cautious, giving examples, and at the end you give that king chain, that sentence, which is a summative to everything. And you move to the next paragraph. Women observe the road safety rules. They don't cross the road robots. They don't speak unnecessarily. They concentrate in their driving. And you write about that until the end. And then you move to the next paragraph until the last one. So you need only four points to dwell with. And how are you going to expatiate on that? You are going to follow PA. You plan, you elaborate, you give examples, and you review. Now, what about a discussive essay? A discussive essay you need two for and two against. Two bad, two good. Men, women are best drivers. Two, I've already mentioned, they are the mothers of the nation. They observe the road safety rules. And they panic so much when they see accident, seeing accident they cause other accident. So you'll speak about these two and about these two. But your last paragraph, that's where you give a stand. Having said the good and the bad, I believe that women are the best drivers. That's all we want to see in your essay. And the very last one is a pictorial essay, what you see. That's a visual. Mr. Zoli has spoken about the visual literacy. What you see, what is needed there, there must be a link between a picture and your story. How? It can be literal or figurative. But what you write, there must be a link between the two. And this type of the essay, it is the easiest. Remember, uh, recently we had had a lot of uh, quotations and expressions of which learners do not understand. You will agree with me that uh, last year they asked about uh, the essay that says, uh, finally I was able to put the puzzle pieces together. A, learners wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and the marks they got were very elementary because they did not understand what is meant by that. We were expecting them to say, finally, we were able to solve A and B, but they just took it literally that a mother came from work with a box and we put the pieces, we failed and failed and failed. Finally, we look at the back of the box, we saw it and we were able to put the pieces together. Did the candidate answer the question? No. So you can encourage them to look at the pictures because when they look at the picture, they can write it as a narrative, as a descriptive, 
as an argumentative, the ball is just on their courts. And ladies, colleagues, make sure that you teach the learners the rubric. And if you teach them the rubric, it will help them to assess themselves. You won't have a lot of work because they can assess themselves. And remember, with an essay, 60% is for the content. The candidate must make sure that the candidate, the candidate does understand the topic. And 15%, 30% is for the language and 5% is for the structure. You will agree with me that at grade 12 uh, class, there are learners who are still writing essays as N3 or N2, all the way from Joburg to Devon, without a comma, without a paragraph, without a, 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 any, any punctuation marks. And that is why we penalize them in the structure. I thank you, colleagues. And practice makes perfect, you can do it. So just do it, you are the best. I thank you. Any questions? Uh, let me thank you guys. Any questions? I am done now. Can I see it? <coughs> Any questions? <coughs> Oh yes, I got a phone and a phone. Hello. Do we have no questions? No questions, ne? Well, thank you. No questions, thank you. Ah, uh, thank you, Ben. No questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I really thank you. And this is Tuli Mamkiz. Bajwa. This is Tuli Mamkize Bajwa. Currently, is a chief marker for English Paper 3. I am the principal of J.E. Jopo High School. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. This is Mr. Nkabini, SI, from Kabikabi Secondary School in Hammerstein, Pines Out District. We are now going to do Paper 2. Thanks to my colleagues, Mr. Zondi, with Paper 1 and our own Mrs. Tulim Bandra with paper 3. Now we are going to do paper 2 and we know it is for 70 marks. What we are going to do today are the two short stories for 10-3. That will be next door and last breath. Next time, I promise you, we will do poetry. Two or three poems. That is what we will do. Now let's remember in paper 2 there are four categories. There is a drama, there is a novel, short stories and poetry. Our candidates must answer two. Preferably the two that they have done at school. Please, they must not try to do something they have never done at school because that will spell disaster. Uh, colleagues, are we all there? Yes. Hello. Thank you. I promise I will, I will not be long. We'll just do the stories next door and last breath. And then if you have questions, I will go to the questions. If we may start. Okay, the first one we'll do is the next door. It's a story written by Kelty Bonnefant, who is an American author who was born in 1922 in Indiana, Indiana, studied chemistry and engineering. After joining the army, he was captured by German forces during World War II. He was imprisoned uh, and the city was bombed. His war experiences would later provide for material of his later writing. He studied science. His work was experimental, leaning towards science, leaning towards science. He died in 2007. Now let's go to the title. Again, it's very important for us. Every time when we do a story, we look at the title. What does it mean? Is there a figurative meaning and a literal meaning? Our learners must know that. Because sometimes you get a question saying, do you think the title is appropriate? And our learners must be able to answer that. And let's remember, there are no other questions, higher order questions, and weekly order questions. The higher order ones are like your three months. Normally they ask for your opinion. Our learners must try and answer those. They must not leave a blank space. Importantly, their responses must be grounded on the text. 
they must not just generalize. So it means they must know the stories as they know themselves. So the title, uh, next door, literally refers to the Huggers and the Leonards. We know those are neighbors whose apartments were separated by a very thin wall. In other words, if we are here and you are speaking loudly, the next door neighbor will hear exactly what you're saying, everything that you are saying. So the setting is in an apartment where the Leonards lived and where the Huggers lived. So we've got our two families, the Leonards and the Huggers. There we are, the Huggers and the Leonards. Narration is third person narration. We normally have first person narration where the narrator is in the story using pronouns such as I, me, us, and here we've got a third person narration. So the person who's speaking is not there, but he knows what is happening. Third person or omniscient. Who are the characters? Characterization. We have Paul, a young boy, eight years old. He loves science and always fiddling. He's always fiddling with his microscope. We have the father, Mr. Leonard. He's the father of Paul. He's also a husband to Mrs. Leonard. Now, the father treats Paul like a man because the story is also about coming of age or manhood. So he thinks, you are eight years old, you are old enough. You can be left alone. For us, I'm not sure if eight years old is old enough. But there's another culture. Mrs. Leonard, there's the mother, Paul's mother. She's very protective. She fights because she wants the son to be, to be uh, protected. She wants the son to be happy, to be safe. And she always calls him a son or a baby. And Mr. Leonard is not happy with that. He says, no, 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 he's now a man. Stop calling him a baby. And then the neighbors, we have Lemuel K. Hager, Mr. Hager. The next door neighbor who fights with his partner. He sharply looks at Paul to ensure he doesn't say a word to the policeman. Now, there's a problem here. The next door, the huggers, they think, or Paul thinks, that it is Mr. and Mrs. Hager who are fighting. Unfortunately, it was not the case. It was Mr. Hager and a mistress or a girlfriend, because we know Mrs. Hager was not there. They had a fight and she left. Now, Mrs. Rose Hager left the husband because of his infidelity. Now, we know if there's infidelity, it means someone is not trustworthy. In this case, someone was cheating. So the man uh, is the only man that cheats. Men do not normally cheat. But this one, for some reason, he cheats. It, it, it's a rare case. It does not happen often. I, I know what I'm talking about. So this one cheated, and the wife just left. They did not divorce. She just left because of the cheating. So infidelity, not trustworthy, you are cheating. Now she only came back and reconciled. This is also about a reconciliation, coming together, solving your problems, and maybe forgiving each other after hearing the dedication from the radio. Another interesting thing, when she hears that dedication, she thinks this is the husband who says, I love you, let's come back together, swallow your pride, etc. Unfortunately, it wasn't, or fortunately, it wasn't. It was actually Paul who had phoned the radio station. And then this is the lady, Charlotte, the mistress, the Makwapen. <laughs> this is the girlfriend. And very violent, eh? very violent. She carries a gun yeah. and she does not play with kids, I'm telling you. Mr. Hacker's mistress or girlfriend had a fight with Mr. Hacker and eventually fired three shots. The policeman, he questioned Paul and Mr. Hacker about the gunshots. DJ Sam, the disc jockey or the radio presenter who Paul phoned to reconcile the fighting couple. Now we can see this is a young boy faced with this problem and he is trying to solve it, to intervene, to mediate by phoning the radio station. Dr. Faye is the family doctor, probably the GP. <clears throat> Plus, how does the story happen? The parents are going out, they are arguing whether to leave Paul or not to leave him alone. That night when they go to the cinema to go and watch movies. So it is at night, are we going to leave him alone? Is he going to be safe? Or are we taking him along? And we know there's a problem. They say, hey, but the movie we are going to watch it is not good for children. And we all wonder, what was it about? At first we were told it was about a girl who, did not, who, who chose friends no, badly and later on we were told it was a bear and the cunning, the, the, the keepers. Now we are not sure what the book was about, but we know it was not for children. Now as soon as the parents leave, the noise of the radio escalates next door. Paul focuses on his microscope but he's disturbed because of the noise. The noise is actually the fight. 
the couple is fighting, they are fighting. We don't know why they're fighting. When the fight gets intense, Paul is terrified. And he intervenes by phoning the radio station, sending a dedication as if it was from Mr. Hagar to Mrs. Hagar. And we know this was not the case. Now, in the climax, we find that after the dedication, the woman fires three shots. Now, why? Because she is angry. You are here with me. Your wife is no more here, but you phoned the radio station saying you want your wife back. How can you do that? So your wife is not going to find you in a very good condition. That's what she says. And she takes out a gun and fires three shots. Fortunately, she did not fire at him. It was just in, on, on the, in the air, just to scare him. And we know he was very scared. Uh, Paul feels guilty that he himself had killed someone. That's what they think. After hearing the gunshots, he thinks, oh my God, what have I done? I was trying to do something right, but unfortunately, they have just shot each other. And he's feeling very guilty. Fortunately, we know no one was killed. He quickly runs out after hearing the gunshots, and there is a woman. And now, that woman is Charlotte. Charlotte was running away after firing those shots. And this woman starts smiling at items into Paul's pocket. Now, what is this? It is a bribery. The woman was a bride in Paul, so that Paul would not say a word to the police. If the police came, he must say, I do not know anything, I do not know who shot, who, who was firing that gun, etc. So it was a bribe. He runs back to the house, the police officer knocks, and to his surprise, Mr. Hagar was still alive. <laughs> Mrs. Hagar heard from the radio, and she went back to her husband, and they reconciled. And we know she came running. She couldn't stop and just hugged the husband and said, yes, I listened to the radio. I've decided to swallow my pride and my self-respect. Here I am. Hmm. What are the themes? There's violence, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the major theme in this story. Conflict. There's a conflict between the mistress and Mr. Hagar and also the wife. That's why she left. Innocence. This Paul is very young. She, he is still very innocent. He was not ready to face all that thing that he faced. Coming of age, manhood, HS older, you men enough, can we be left alone, etc. Reconciliation, when Rose came back and they reconciled. Also responsibility versus irresponsible. Ir irresponsibility. Were the parents responsible by leaving Paul alone at night and going for hours away? Or was that an act of irresponsibility? What would you do? Would you leave your child alone at night and go to a movie or get a sitter like the wife suggested? She said, no, no, no. Perhaps we must get a sitter. If we don't get a sitter, let me make sure Paul has got all the numbers. The police, the fire department, the doctor, the, the, the cinema. Whatever happens, Paul must be safe. So she gave all those to make sure that Paul was protected. <sighs> Again, uh, analysis or elements, the title we know, literally the next door refers to neighbors, Haggard and Leonard, whose apartments were separated, the characters, we know them, themes I've said about them, third person narration, setting, United States of America, an apartment where the Haggard and Leonard lived, separated by a thin wall. This was written a long time ago, we can see by the kind of music that they played and the telephone, we are told the telephone and the dining pad. You put your, your finger there and then you have to wait. It is an old thing, not the cell phone that we use now. So this was done a long time ago. If you can go back. Uh, conflict, when Mr. and Mrs. Leonard leave to watch a movie next door, neighbors begin to fight, which makes the young boy helpless and devastated. Actually, what happens? Firstly, Mr. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Leonard leave Paul and go to watch a movie. Then a fight ensues. Next door, Paul tries to intervene by phoning DJ, uh, DJ Sam for help. And another question would be, is it right to interfere in other people's businesses? Was Paul doing the right thing by trying to intervene? Or was he supposed to say, no, no, this is something else. It does not belong to us. It's another family. I do not have anything to do with it. Or was he being responsible in trying to mediate and bring peace? Now, that's an argument or uh, something that you can have with your children to speak about it. Now, upon hearing the dedication, the girlfriend, Charlotte, is angry and she fires three shots. Climax, when Paul heard the three shots, 
and told the someone had died, Mr. Lehman Hager appears and Charlotte Bryce Paul into keeping quiet. Now, in the end, the Dinuma resolution outcome, Mrs. Hager returns to her husband and the Leonardo returns to find Paul sleeping with a ball of money in his pocket. Because we know they, they, they were, there was a lipstick, there was perfume, there was money. All those things were given to Paul to make sure he keeps quiet. He does not say anything. And we have some questions there. I'm not going to go to the answers. Uh, remember, our learners will be given an extract, and most questions will be based on the extract. However, the candidates must know the entire story because not all the questions will be from the extract. So let's teach our learners you must know the whole story first, and then you read the extract that we are giving. Normally, they'll say, refer to line one or line seven, you must go to refer to that, and the answer will be there. They don't make that mistake. So know your story, know that it's going to be an extract. It will be 18 marks or 17 marks because there will be two stories, both will be for 35 marks. Here we have Atlanta is <coughs> the lead to Rose returning home. Why did she come back? Obviously, there was a, uh, Paul was left alone, there was a fight next door. Uh, Paul phoned the radio station and Mrs. Hunter heard the dedication and she decided to come back. Why does the, poli why does the policeman who questioned Paul wanted to find out about the gunshots? Consecutive, called seven consecutive wins. Mr. Zoni has alluded to this. If they say consecutive, you must make sure those words follow each other. They are conservative, consecutive, and you must always write your quotation marks. However, you will not be penalized. Okay, let's not tell them, but we know as teachers, our learners are not penalized for not putting quotation marks. But if they say called a word, it must be one word. If there are two words, even if the word is there, it's incorrect. If they say two words, it must be two. If they say seven, it must be seven. Refer to line 4 to 6, she bashed, bumping, blurring about the manner, and they say, uh, suggest, what does this suggest about the way in which Rose returns to them? Explain the answer. Badging, she was running wildly, she could not be stopped, she couldn't wait to go to her husband. Now we get the feeling that she really loved the husband, even though they had a fight and she left, she was still loving the husband, which is a good thing, and they reconciled. 515. What does them to respond to Rose reveal about the character? When the Rose, Rose, Rose never leave me again, you know? Now it suggests that he is not honest, he is dishonest. He is saying this as if he wanted, he needed, he was alone. Whereas we know he wasn't alone, he was with a girlfriend, he was happy there until Mrs. Leonardo returned. Explain the irony in Rose's words. Men are just lost with that women. Again, if we go to irony, there are two parts. Both the parts must be explained fully. If the candidate only explains one part, there will be a zero. There are no half marks. If it's two marks, it's all two marks. If it's four marks, it's four marks. We cannot get one, two, or three instead of four. So in irony, we know there's a figure of speech, there's something, and there's an opposite of something. Now, she said men are just lost without women. Mrs. Harker thinks that the husband was lonely, the husband needed her, whereas we know the husband was not lonely, the husband did not need her, he was busy with the mistress until they had a fight. So this is what she thinks, but this is what happened. We must show the contradiction or the opposite. I repeat, for irony, you must always state the two parts. If you do not state them clearly, you will not get full marks. Refer to line 16 and 17, the ball of money, blah, blah, swelled to a size of a watermelon, identify the figure of speech that is exaggerated, exaggeration or hyperbole. Uh, what does this figure of speech suggest? It means Paul was tempted, Paul could not say a thing because of all this money. This was a large sum of money. Refer to the story as a whole. Now, in your opinion, this is the open-ended. Are Paul's parents are irresponsible in leaving him home alone? So you can say yes, they are irresponsible, you are an adult, you cannot leave an eight-year-old child alone, it was bad, or you can say no, they were responsible because they made sure they are neighbors next door and then they left all these numbers in cases of emergency. So you can take this part or the other part. We can also have a combination, although I do not, uh, I, I do not encourage our learners to have combination answers because it's sometimes difficult for them. Let them just take one part and elaborate on that. Is there a question, uh, colleagues? Let's have a brief summary and analysis. Do we have a question? Next door? Question? 
No question, can I go to last prayer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to last prayer. Now, last prayer again, the altar. It's very important to say something about the altar because normally uh, the altar, where he lived, what he experienced, normally informs his or her writing. Now, the author is Sam Kahiga. He's an author born in 1946 in Kenya. He studied art and design in Nairobi University, then worked for the National Broadcaster. We know ours is SAPC Kenya, maybe Kenyan Broadcasting Corporation, something like that. Later, he turned to full time writing, writing short stories and novels. And today we are going to do a short story. He was also a painter and a musician, a man of many talents. He did a lot of things, writing, uh, was in broadcasting, a painter and musician. He's a man of many talents. He's married to a lady, a very beautiful lady, Kui Kahinga. He's very beautiful. You can go to the internet and look at their marriage, you know, uh, their wedding brother. Title, again, I said you must always look at the title. There may be a question about the title. Last prayer, it refers to death, literally. It symbolizes the father of the narrator's death, which is very significant in the life of Eva. Now, we know in the story there are very few characters. There's the father, there's the mother, there's the speaker or the narrator, and there's the girlfriend of the speaker, which is Eva. It brings a total change in happiness in the family. They were very happy, especially the narrator and Eva after the father died. Literally, when the father takes his last breath or dies, when someone dies, you're taking your last breath. Figuratively, the father's last breath brought a new life to Eva as she was able to see. Now, we learn in the story that Eva is actually a blind woman. She is blind, she cannot see. And we are not told what happened, whether she was born like that or there was an accident, we do not know. What we know is that she is blind. But the boy or the speaker or the narrator is madly in love with this woman. And the father cannot understand it. Out of all the girls, why are you so in love with a blind person? Now that is discrimination, that is prejudice. Because she is blind, therefore she cannot help someone she loves. That is very unfair. Same thing, where does the story happen? At the beginning of the story, they are driving back from Eva's school. The father and the narrator are coming back from the school of the blind, where Eva was, was, was learning. Uh, the story is also set at the home where they live. It's important to say that the narrator is still living at home with his parents. Now we can conclude, maybe he was not financially free at that moment. He could not afford his own home. That, that's just something we can conclude. Also, we will see when it comes to the ring that he buys for the engagement. It's not a very expensive ring. It's not gold, it's not diamond. It's, very, it's a cheap copper. It also tells us that financially, he was not good. He was struggling. Definitely not a teacher, because teachers are not struggling. <laughs> I'm joking. Narration, first person. Characterization, the characters, the narrator or the speaker. He is strong-willed. This is a half-related word. Strong world, he loves Eva regardless of her blindness. He loves her deeply regardless, unconditionally. And he presses on, although his father is against his wishes. He said, I want to marry this woman. And the father said, oh, but my dead body, no son of mine is going to marry someone who is blind. Never, it will not happen. The father dearly loves his son to a point of taking decisions for him. Now, we are adults, we are teachers. Is it the right thing when we take decisions on behalf of our children or our learners even? Is it the right thing? Can't we hear them and listen to them and support them? But we know it is all in good faith. The father did that in good faith. He really thought he was doing the right thing. At first, the son wanted to do something, to go and study music. But the father was against it, saying, no child of mine is going to do music. You go and work at the bank, and that is where he's working. And now he wants to marry this blind girl, and the father again interferes, saying, no, no son of mine is going to marry someone who is blind. Never. I am not going to have a daughter in law who is blind. Never. Is that the right thing we can discuss? The mother, she loves both the husband and the son, obviously. She is more of a mediator and a peacemaker. In the family, she understands the son's decision to marry Eva. Although in the text it does say she would be happy if the son decided against marrying Eva, but she supported the son nevertheless. Although she wasn't happy about it, but she understood that if Eva makes him happy, so be it. Unfortunately, the father could not hear a thing about that. 
Now, Eva is the narrator's girlfriend who is blind. She is very supportive. Her boyfriend actually says, she's the only one who understands me better. This is how the narrator feels. My parents do not understand me, but my girlfriend, she's the best. She loves me, she understands me. I want to spend the rest of my life with her. Interesting, you not know, a Eva is the only character that is giving a specific name. The others is the narrator, speaker, father, mother, but Eva is the only one giving a specific name. Now, normally, when the story has got characters without specific names, a boy, a girl, a gardener, a mother, a father, it's normally a generalization, meaning this is a stereotype, these people represent other people in our society. But when this one is given a specific name, Eva, it means or oh, the, the reader must focus. The writer wants the reader us to focus on her. She's disabled, she's got qualities, she's unique. Because normally, when it comes to people who are blind or who are disabled, or they say differently abled, they're not disabled, they are differently abled. That's the PC way, the politically correct term differently able to people, we, we call them names, we don't take good care of them, we say whatever we want to say, but this time she is important, we must focus on her, she's given a specific name, she is Eva, the others are not that important, but this one is important, despite her blindness. Plot, how does the story happen? At first we see the narrator and his father driving back from school, it is where uh, Eva was, was schooling. He thought his father would change his mind about Eva after their meeting. Now at first we learn that the mother went to the school to see Eva and then the son also took the father. Thinking after seeing her and seeing the angel in her, the inner Eva, maybe the father will change in the position and say, it's fine my son, you can marry. But unfortunately, he did not change. You know men, you know, typical traditional men who say, no, never, not in my house. This is not going to happen. I stand by it's not going to happen. This is the kind of thing that happened. Fathers being stubborn. And now I'm not saying fathers are stubborn, but this one is. It's an exception. Uh, unfortunately, the father still doesn't approve his son marrying a blind girl. The narrator is adamant. He's saying, come rain or sunshine, I'm going to marry her when I come of age in August. Now we are not given a specific age of the narrator, but normally coming of age is normally 21, when you can make your own decisions, you can get married, etc. And we know that he wanted to study music, we can assume he finished school and wanted to go to college, and then now he's working at the bank. He's probably 20, 21, probably. The father is upset. He's a very cops and nearly causes an accident, a very dangerous accident. When they come back from the school, he's angry, they are still arguing inside the car, and he is coughing, and the cough was a terrible cough. Now, this is called foreshadowing. The writer is already giving us a clue of what is going to happen, and we're going to learn later, we are going to learn later, that the father was actually suffering from lung cancer, hence the coughing. The narrator looks back and says that his father always takes decisions for him. E.g. he wanted to study music, but the father said no, now he's working at the bank. The mother comes to the narrator's room, checks how the journey was. The mother is worried and informs the narrator that your father has lung cancer. Now I don't like this because it's more like manipulation. She says, I don't mind you marrying her, although I would love you to change your mind, but be careful. If you continue arguing with your father, your father is ill, gravely ill. If he is unhappy, he may die because of lung cancer. For me, that was manipulation. She was trying to convince the son not to marry uh, Eva, even though she does not state it directly. The narrator is shaken by this. He is shocked. He did not know that the father, his father was suffering of lung cancer. But still, despite that, he did not change his stance. He still said, despite my father's illness, I love my father, I respect him, I know he means well. But whether he's sick or not, whether he dies or not, I'm still going to marry this woman. This is a love story. The father is yes. intensifies and he is hospitalized. The narrator visits Eva with the aim of proposing to her. And he says, it's August now, I'm proposing. Please, would you make me the happiest man and marry me? And very unexpected, Eva says, no, I'm not going to marry you. I'm not accepting your proposal. And the reason would be, but why? Because they love each other. She said something very interesting. She said, someone, an anonymous person, someone I do not know, had decided to donate with his cornea. Now, please, the cornea is not an eye. It is 
something in the eye. It's a membrane. It's a membrane in the eye that allows a person to have sight to see. Our learners just say uh, the father gave the, the eyes. eyes. Oh. It's not true. It's not true. Cornea is just a membrane in the eye that allows you to have sight, that allows you to see. So that is what the father donated when he died on his last spread. Look at it, they know that it was the narrator's father who did this. Now, anonymous, they don't know who it was, but we then later, it was actually the father, when he was dying, he donated. So the story is also about organ donation. When you donate a certain part of your body to give another person a chance. Now, why did the father do that? Maybe he regretted what he did, maybe, being against the son. Maybe he accepted that despite whatever, despite how I feel, they are still going to get married. But most importantly, he wanted his son. Now Eva is able to see. She will regain his eyesight. I thank you very much for the sacrifice that you did. Now, themes. There are many themes. Parents interfering with children's choices. The father interfering with the son's decisions. Organ donation. The father donating his cornea. Discrimination. The father discriminating against Eva because she is blind, visually impaired. Is it the right thing to discriminate against people because of their uh, disabilities? Prejudice. Biased, judging people because of their disabilities, power over romantic relationships. These people are so in love, this young couple. It's like Romeo and Juliet, yes. except that no one died between them. <laughs> but it's very strong that the son is willing to go to an extra mile for the person he loves. That the son is prepared to argue and fight and conflict with his parents because of the woman that he loves. So he's prepared to go to any extent just for the woman that he has. And we need more people like that who would sacrifice and do anything for the people they love. Mm. Mm. Another one is sight versus blindness. Actually, the first three sentences of the story, we are giving way to watching, watching, looking, uh, eyes. All those have to do with the sight, being able to see. And then we know later that there is a woman called Eva who is blind. Sacrifices, the father sacrificed. Commitment, they were committed, they were loving each other. Conflict, there's a conflict between the parents and the son. Control, the parents, especially the father, wanted to control his son. Selfish, selfness, at the end the father showed that he is, self, he is not selfish. He gave his cornea to show that I love you my son, I will support you. Gratitude, we know that son goes to the grave to say thank you for everything. It is a sign of gratitude. And then change, we know. By donating the cornea, it means the father changed how he was feeling when he stands. Not a bene. In the first three sentences, there are references to eyes and sights. E.g. watched, glanced, watching, look, and eye. At first, the narrator is sad and bitter because of the circumstances he finds himself in because his father, who makes choices for him, very unhappy and bitter throughout the story, except at the end. There is an internal conflict which is experienced when the narrator feels angry because his father neither likes nor approves of the narrator's relationship with Eva at first. Then there is an external conflict where we see the father and the narrator arguing and fighting about the narrator's intention to marry a blind Eva. Symbolism, what do the following symbolize? One, the ring, it symbolizes the deep love the narrator has for Eva. Although it is a copper ring and it is cheap, it's a thought that counts. It's not the money that you have. So by your giving her the ring, symbolize that I love you, I'm committed. It symbolizes that commitment. I am committed, I want us. Commitment. Cornea. Uh, excuse the spelling. I'm told the spelling is wrong. In this paper too, the spelling still has to be correct. Right? It still has to be correct. Cornea symbolizes the sacrifice the father made in order to help Eva and the narrator. Selflessness on the side of the narrator's father. And then sunshine. There's reference to sunshine. Now sunshine symbolizes light, joy, happiness, warmth, brightness. And when, when they said sunshine was forever born with my mother, that was very worrying. It was symbolizing the concern and the worry of the mother that the father has got lung cancer and the father was terribly ill. He was about to die. The severe cough, foreshadowing again, the writer 
giving us an idea of what is coming, what is going to happen. It may be the sign that the father has got lung cancer and he's going to die. These are all the symbolism what this following uh, represent. Tiger again, last spread what it means, the characters, uh, themes, the point of view, the uh, first person setting in the car, even school and rural family home, probably in the 1900s conflict. The narrator is making in love with Eva and wants to marry her, but his father is adamant that you are not going to marry her because she is blind. What happened first? The narrator and his father, the narrator and his father argue about marrying Eva. The narrator's mother manipulates him, saying, Your father is ill and he will die if you insist on marrying her. The narrator makes a marriage proposal to Eva, but she refuses it, saying, No, I want to have my eyesight first, I want to see the ring. Don't engage, don't, don't propose to me when I cannot see the ring. Like every girl, I want to see the bling bling. Unfortunately, it was not real. It was very cheap, but it's the thought that matters. Climax, the narrator's father dies and Eva goes to hospital to get a new cornea from the narrator's father and she is able to see. In the end, the narrator marries Eva and sees the love of his father through her eyes. So when he, when he looks at the, at the woman she loves, when, when, when he looks at this, at this woman, at this wife, and he's like, yes, my father really loved me, hence you can see. Now this is a question paper from uh, December 2017. Uh, again, we'll be giving an extract. Our candidates will be giving an extract, and they must read the extract first and answer questions based on the extract. One or two answers will require the overall knowledge of the story. Where do the speaker and his father go to see Eva? They go to the school, refer to lines, my last way to Rura to marry me, identify the speaker's tone, you know, determined, I'm making sure. I am going to ask her to marry me despite what you say. So, determination, he was sure what you are saying. Was the speaker's tone appropriate? Yes, it was appropriate because he was determined he was not going to be persuaded otherwise. He was going to do what he wants to do, which was going to marry this woman. Uh, what do the words the angel in here suggest about Eva's character and personality? An angel. It means she was sweet, she was angelic. It was like she was sent from heaven to earth. She's got those qualities, you know, angel like heaven. Uh, what, what's the word? Uh, pure, innocent, religious, beautiful, because holy, holy yes, <laughs> holy, you know, from, from heaven. Uh, called six consecutive words, again, consecutive words. Have your inverted commas, and you write one, two, three, four, five, six. If there are seven words, it's all wrong. If there are less than six, it's wrong. You must always look at the number. Sometimes they don't use the number, they just say, called a word. And we know from paper one, a word, that is one, a, it's one, singular, plural. We know concord, we know it's going to go there. What did the speaker's father correct? He corrected this, he corrected the swerving of the car. As they were driving, he was very angry, he was not concentrating on the road, and he nearly caused an accident, a fatal accident, very dangerous. Again, Almost an accident, something dangerous, it also shows us that there's going to be an accident or something bad is going to happen when the father dies. It's again foreshadowing. How does the narrator's relationship with his father differ from the relationship with his mother? They are always fighting with the father from when he was young until now, but with the mother, it's more understanding. The mother is more accepting. Typical mother, always by your son or your daughter, supporting yeah, in all yeah, this day. Exactly. Most mothers are like that and we appreciate that. Later in the story, the speaker proposes Mary to Eva, explain why the following statement is false. Please tell our candidates, they must not say this is false. This is given, this is stated, we know it is false. But tell us why it is false. And they say, sorry, the speaker proposes with a diamond ring. It is false because we know the speaker proposes with a copper ring, a cheap copper ring. Diamond and the copper are two different things. So this is false because there is a copper ring and the spelling is correct. <laughs> what is the matter response to the speaker's proposal? I'll say two points. She refuses the proposal. She says, no, I'm not going to accept this proposal. I'm not going to marry you now. And then two, she says, I am one to wait until I go to the hospital, I have an operation, I get my cornea, a cornea, and I'm able to see. Only then will I accept a proposal. In other words, I want to wait until I can see that link. And that's what happened. This comes how the theme of discrimination. When it comes to theme, they may give you a theme like 
they've done here, they give you a theme and you must discuss or explain or show how this theme is evident in the story. Again, don't just discriminate and say discrimination when somebody is doing this or another person, it must not be general. Be specific who is discriminating against who in this story. And we know the father is discriminating against this woman because she is blind. The narrator's father is discriminating. He is prejudiced. He does not support, he does not want his son to marry her because she is blind. Show it, base it on the text. Do not generalize. Those are your three marks. Then discuss the suitability of the title, last friend. Do you think that this title is suitable? Is that a correct title to be given to this story? And most people will say, yes, it is, because this is about the last breath. The last breath, when the father was dying, it's about him donating a cornea. He said, when I die, make sure you take out this membrane on my eye and give it to that woman. And that is three months. I, I thank you. Uh, how are we doing? Questions, complaints, <laughs> comments? All of the above. Or all of the above. <laughs> Do we have a question, a comment, something to add, something to subtract? Hello, colleagues. Is that fine? Okay, then I will, I, will, I will assume everything is fine, you are all okay. Uh, this material we are going to get as soon as possible, uh, it will be sent to you via email to the subject advisors and your different centers. If you need anything from these notes, all the notes, paper one, paper two, and paper three, you will get them. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, it's two o'clock. We meet again in September. We will meet again in September where we'll be doing poetry and drama, mostly the questions because we are preparing our learners for the trial exams and the ultimate exams. Maybe we can also try and see which ones are likely to come out. It's not an imposing, but you can just deduce from looking at the past question papers. I thank you very much. <laughs>